Good evening and welcome to the live stream Bible study of the Abundant Love Church. I am Pastor Gary Bush. Thank you for tuning in this evening on our live stream feed as we worship and praise the Lord and as we study his word. Uh, so this evening uh, we will sing a song, have a word of prayer, a few announcements, maybe another song and then we'll go right into our lesson study tonight. Our song is praise him, praise him in the morning, in the new day, even praise him when the sun goes down. If you know it with us, sing it with us. by the stream. 
Let them feel your presence. Let the truth of your word be expressed and let it be felt and received by every soul tonight in the name of Jesus. Now remember this nation in the throngs, in the throngs of division. Show yourself strong in our behalf. In our behalf, Lord. Unite us, Lord, with one mind. Lord, unite us, Lord, with one mind to please you and to help our fellow man. In the name of Jesus, breathe on the church again. Breathe revival in the church, Lord. In Jesus' name, because your touch will deliver and set free. Cause us to be very sober-minded, serious people about the things of God. Now, Father, tonight, as we come together to study your word, let rhema word be dispensed tonight to every hungry soul. And we do love you and we thank you and we give your name praise in Jesus' name. Come on, clap your hands. The people say, thank God. Amen. Amen. How many know we serve an awesome God? Look at somebody say, our God is awesome. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. He can move Keep me in the valley, forever he will reign. Our God is awesome, 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 awesome. Our God is awesome, awesome. will forgive me. I just kind of felt that in my spirit. Wasn't known to sing tonight, but how many know we serve an awesome God? Yes, he is. He's an awesome. All right, clap your hands there one more time. Amen. All right, God bless you. We're certainly happy to be here this evening. I'm going to ask the announcer if they would get ready uh, to give us the announcement tonight. Amen. I want to remind you all that we are right in the middle of our consecration. Amen. We have a consecration that started, amen, a week and a half ago, and we have a week and a half to go. Amen. How many feel the effects of the consecration? Amen. 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 That first week is a tough week, but once you get into the swing of things, amen, the thing that I've noticed is that the Lord meets me in a hurry when I call him. Amen. And I like it when the Lord comes with a quick response. Amen. Not that I mind waiting on the Lord, but it's always a good thing when the Lord shows up. Amen? Amen. amen. All right. God bless you. We're going to call our announcer now. Say amen, everyone, uh, to Sister Natasha Hill. Amen. Good evening, family. Our live streams are now open while observing social distancing, face mask guidelines, and temperature checks. Um, if you are able to join us in our regular services, our times are Sundays. Sunday school is at 9.30 a.m. We have our morning worship starting at 10.45 a.m. On Wednesdays, we have intercessory prayer starting at 6 p.m. And Disciples Academy Bible study starting at 6.30 p.m. Our upcoming events, um, as you know, our church doors are now open, open. Our Sunday school and Bible study will now include live interactions with questions and or comments. We are also reintroducing intercessory prayer on Wednesday evenings from 6 p.m. to 6.25 before Bible study. And we encourage your attendance and your participation. 
We are in the process of updating all members' contact information. Please see myself or Evangelist Vera Drew to update um, a change of address, phone numbers, or email addresses. Did you know that you can contribute to the church through your Kroger or your Amazon Smile programs? Once signed up, a portion of once signed up, a portion of the amount purchased are given back to the church. You can even invite your family members or friends to sign up as well. Please see one of our secretaries to get more information on how, how to get started. Our sick and recovery and bereavement includes Philip Johnson, Travion Hilliard, Anidra Green, Marianne Cook, Daisha Fuquay, and Cynthia Franks. Keep those members in your prayers. Uh, we also now have uh, different platforms that you can view our services, get an uh, inspirational quote, things of that nature. Um, our platforms now include Facebook at Abundant Love Church. We are now on Instagram, Abundant.Love. Twitter, Abundant Love at 8. L M S Fort Wayne and our website is in redevelopment as we speak. We archive all of our streams as well. You can find those at Abundant Love Church on our Facebook page, capital A, capital L, capital C. Um, on YouTube, our YouTube channel is capital A L Ministries. And we also have Motivating Moments videos uh, every Monday morning on our Facebook page. These are all of our announcements. Govern yourselves accordingly. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise just for another day's journey? Hallelujah. And I'm glad about it. Thank you, Jesus. So God, he inherits our praise and he loves to hear us when we give him praise and when we give him thanks and when we give him all of the glory. Hallelujah. So we're going to sing this song, breathe in, breathe out. Know that he loves us so much. Breathe in, breathe out. Hallelujah. Because the breath of the Lord, hallelujah, we are nothing but the grace of God. We breathed in and breathed out, I don't know how many times on the day. And I thank him for his strength to be able to breathe in and breathe out. Hallelujah. But it's enough to be able to give God praise. Amen. Amen. Breathe in. Breathe out. Feel the warmness of his touch. Breathe in.
situation, all you have to do is lift the praise. Amen. I like to say it like this. I say true praise is irresistible to God. He can't help but show up when the praise is there. Well, pastor, do you have to be in church? No. You can be down in jail. Paul and Silas, can you help me? Yes, sir, Pastor Bush. We got beat for preaching the word of God and they threw us down in the Philippian jail and at midnight we sang and prayed amen and it must have got good because God couldn't resist tapping his foot to that praise amen sent an earthquake shook the whole jail and shook the chains off the people that were in there don't fool yourself praise will shake some shackles off of you the situation you know, sometimes the situation doesn't change but you change in the middle of the situation. 
Amen. He's a great God, isn't he? All right, clap your hands one more time. Amen. Thank you, Sister Kyra. Amen. For such an anointed song. Incidentally, that is a selection that was written by my youngest, uh, my baby sister, Darlene. Amen. Beautiful song. Wonderful song. Certainly, we've enjoyed it. I want to thank the musicians, Ebony and, and Corey. Glad to see Corey back. Amen. And Grayson also played for us this evening. Amen. Certainly happy. Amen. How many know everybody has a part to play? Amen. Incidentally, if what I'm trying to communicate through this particular series of Kingdom First is that for the kingdom to grow as it should, every person must be in place must be responsible with the gifts that God has given them and operating and perfecting them. And then tonight we'll find out that when those gifts are in place and they're operating, the body will uh, edify itself and cause growth. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. Uh, I'm going to call your attention. to St. Matthew 6 and 33, and also Mark 12 and 28. Uh, on last Wednesday, I did make mention to uh, look at 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 because we will make references to them tonight. Uh, and even though this is point number three, I'm gonna do a little review to kind of bring us up to speed how this all works together, amen? Amen. Okay. St. Matthew 6, in verse number 33, it reads like this. It says, okay, let's read together. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> Amen. I almost took off without you. Right, if you have the King James Version, we'll sing it all together. All right, St. Matthew 6, 33. Let's read it together in chorus, and it reads, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. All right. That's all I'm going to read this evening. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And can you repeat with me? Say kingdom first. Kingdom first. Kingdom first. And uh, we've been teaching and preaching for every session and service this month about how important it is to put God first in everything. We believe that if you started in the right direction, that it will continue in the right direction. So uh, we want a lot of added things, but the way to get those added things is to put God first in every place. Amen? Amen. 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 Our introduction says this. It says, Jesus instructs us to seek first, that is with first priority, the kingdom of God. And in so doing, that is seeking the kingdom first, that all the things that pertain to abundant life and godliness would be added to us. But for these things to be added, we must acquire and maintain the proper priority, that is keeping God first, and the proper discipline, that is consistency, regularity, and follow-through. And this discipline is achieved when we give our plan and the plan of God the correct priority. Amen. That is, kingdom first. And seeking God's kingdom, we must, or rather, in seeking the kingdom of God, we must keep seeking the kingdom as position and priority one for our plan to work and the goals that we have to be achieved. Amen? Amen. Amen. When Jesus was 12 year old, uh, they left him at the temple. They didn't know they had left him. They went a, a, a day's journey or so, uh, and they looked and didn't find him among the company. So they turned around, they went back to the temple, and they found Jesus in the temple sitting among the doctors, answering and asking questions. And they said to him, said, son, why have you done us like this? We've been looking, sorrowing for you. 
Uh, and I'm sure that every parent in a crowded place that have lost sight of their child knows exactly the panic and the feeling of trauma that comes over you. But when they finally found him, the Jesus, the answer that Jesus gave was very, very uh, direct and revealing. He said, how is it you sought me and you didn't know that I would be here about my father's business? So Jesus makes reference to the father's business. And I want to tell you what the father's business is. The father's business is his kingdom. Okay. It's all about sending Jesus to save and everybody that's saved goes into his kingdom. And incidentally, the vehicle that brings people into the kingdom is the church. So the church is God's business. Amen. It's not just a place that we go to on Sunday and then has, has no impact on our lives the rest of the week. Hopefully and truthfully, the principles that we learn from the word of God in the physical church should have impact on every other aspect of our lives. So when we say kingdom first, we're not just talking about the life that we live and the things that we do in the worship experience. We're talking about implementing those principles into every part of our lives, how we handle our relationships, how we handle our children, how we conduct ourselves in the workplace, how we act in the community. In other words, it should be all encompassing to every part of our lifestyle. So the kingdom gives us the principles of how God does things. A kingdom is a realm where a king reigns. God is the king. And so God has given us his word and his word tells us how we should operate in the kingdom. Amen. Okay. So I've been speaking from a corporate standpoint and I want to continue to operate and teach from a church and corporate standpoint because it is not just your personal ministry, but it is the ministry that you combine into the work of the kingdom that the Father is pleased with. Amen? Amen. Amen. So uh, I'm just going to give you just kind of a, you know, short, brief review here. Uh, we use the reference of the fourth chapter of Ephesians and in verse number 11, it talks about who God gave. The Bible says that he gave uh, some prophets, uh, or rather gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Those are people gifts that God has given to the church. And he's not only given these people to the church, he's given them an assignment. In verse number 12, it talks about their assignment. Their assignment is to perfect the saints, that is, to make sure that the saints mature. After the saints mature, he gave them for the work or the service of the ministry. And what the ministry is in the corporate church is the community. He lets us know how the community of saved people work. Amen? And then not just the... Uh, work of the ministry, he talks about the edifying or the building of the body of Christ, which is the church, the body of Christ, the bride of, the bride of Christ, and God's business. Look okay. at somebody say, the church is God's business. The church is God's business. Okay, Jesus said it like this in Matthew 16. He said, if on this rock I will, build Jesus is building the church. And the church, if you allow me to say, is the doorway into the kingdom of God. The church is the gateway that allows you to go in and spend eternity with God. When the Lord comes back, he's coming back for a church. The Bible says without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And so a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the maturing of the saints. And from a corporate perspective, uh, you have to be in the word, you have to be in corporate prayer, you have to worship, and you have to congregate. We'll uh, get into that congregating on this evening. On last week, we talked about the spiritual gifts. And if you look into the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, not only those nine 
uh, ministry gifts that we talked about, but at the bottom of number 12, it, it mentioned a few other ones. It talked about administration. And, and so the reason I said that those nine were an abbreviated list, because there were more up above. And it talks about uh, down in verse number um, down in verse number 28, it says, God has set some in the church. Now, I don't want to get in trouble here. Uh, everybody, not an apostle. Amen. Okay. All right. It didn't say all. It said some. Okay. So he set some in the church. First, the apostles. Secondarily, the prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles and gifts of healing. Here it is. Governments. Governments are types of administration. It's type it's the type of people that look over uh, particular portions and make sure that it carries a certain order so that it meets all of its objectives. Amen? Yeah. Government, diversity of tongues. I told you everybody was an apostle. Verse number 29 says, are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. no. So what it's saying is that there are some people in in the body that have assignments so it's very very important that you know what your gift is and your assignment is so you can be in the proper place amen, amen. okay so we talked about the gifts empowering the body everybody has at least one gift some people have more gifts and depending on how you operate that gift will depend on if you uh, 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 have the opportunity to have more gifts and more opportunities or uh, get a reprimand for not using it. Because everybody that used their gift, the Bible says they got complimented on using it and multiplying it. And people who had a gift that didn't use it, they got a reprimand from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, so the gifts, the gifts are there for the body. And every uh, physical body has different parts. And a good, well-trained, fit, in tune body has every member in place working as it should. And when you take that example from the natural body to the spiritual body of Christ, it is the duty of every person in the church. Now, I want you to listen to me real good because I'm not just talking to people here in the room with me. I'm talking to you at home. And even if you belong to another church, to another congregation. It is not the pastor and the leader's responsibility to employ your gift. Yeah. It is your job to find out what your gift is, how the Bible has said your gift is to operate, and then to move into the place where that gift can become functional in the body. Because any part of the body that's not functioning as it should handicaps the body okay when you're not in operation some other part of the body has to handle the responsibility that you have and so that the body doesn't cumber and move in an awkward fashion every joint the bible says has to be in place and it has to give what it supplies for the healthy growth of the body and we'll get into that a little later so uh, if you look at your handout I have uh, approximately, uh, I have some verses and then I have some verses that I'm going to add. I finished at verse number 12 in Ephesians 4. And before we go into 12 and 13 of 1 Corinthians, I want you to go to Ephesians 4. And I'm going to finish that with verses 13, 14, 15, and 16. Ephesians 4, verse 13, verse 14. Verse 15 and verse 16. Again, verse 11 tells you who God gave. Verse number 12 tells you why he gave them. There are people in the church to help you mature. That word perfect means grow up. You all do know uh, that people need to grow up in church now. Amen. Some people get stuck in a place of growth. And it's never good to be stuck in a place of growth before you get grown because if you get stuck in one of the stages of growth, you'll get to be an adult, but you won't operate and act like an adult. Okay, now don't look around at nobody, but we all know people who are old enough to handle their responsibility, but they don't handle their responsibility. Okay, 
Being grown is not an age. It's not how long you've been in the church. You know, we used to say, <laughs> we used to have saints that said, yeah, I've been in this, been in the way a long time. And that's part of the problem. You've been in the way. Okay. You got to get out of the way so that God can work through you and get his work done. So maturity, maturity simply means this. It's having a working knowledge of the word of God so that you don't need milk and you can digest meat. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, so digesting meat means that you're able to take word that kind of stings you when you're not up to it and not get an attitude of man. If, if you get mad at correction, that's a sure sign that you're immature. Okay? Because correction is never meant to belittle you. It's always meant to better you. So it's a blessing when somebody comes along and says, that's not the way it should be done. Here's the way it should be done. And then instruction in that direction. Amen? Yeah. Another sign of immaturity is knowing your responsibility and not performing it. My father always told me, you are not grown when you're 18. You're not grown when you're 21. You are grown when you find out what your responsibility is and you handle your responsibility consistently without supervision. Amen. Amen. So if you drive the car, but you can only drive it while somebody's watching you, you're still immature. Yeah. Amen. You have to be able to handle your responsibility without oversight or supervision. So maturity basically in the body of Christ is knowledge of the word, understanding the gift set that you've been given, and then in the process of operating, deploying that gift so it can be perfected for the good of the body. Amen. Now that's the short version. If you really didn't catch it just then, if you go back to the stream on last week, I'll explain it in more detail on last week's stream. So, uh, so we have to mature, and only after we mature can we do the work of the ministry. Because if you have immature people doing the work of the ministry, what happens is that responsibilities get missed and neglected. I didn't get no amens. Okay. Missed and neglected means somebody should have did it and it wasn't done. Amen. Yeah. And you, you all, you all, I don't, I don't need to be belabor that point, do I? Amen. It's, it's, uh, you know, there's certain things that if you forget to do, uh, it costs everybody to do. Uh, it costs everybody in the house. If you use the milk and you forget to put the milk back in the refrigerator, everybody suffers. No milk for anybody if the milk goes bad. Amen? amen. Brothers, amen. If we take the, you know, the stool seat and leave it up, other people suffer if we don't put it down. Amen. amen. All, I, all the sisters should have said amen just then. <laughs> And then so, so what I'm trying to show you is that neglected responsibilities cost more than the person who neglected it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, so the work of the ministry has to be done by people who are mature. Has to be done by people who understand their gift set, understand when it's supposed to be operated, and understand that it's not for their own self-glory. Anytime you operate your gift, it should be for the good of the body. Amen. Amen. If you sing and you sing only for yourself, that's not for the body. Right. And you have to put it in a place where the whole body, Sister Kyra didn't sing that song tonight in her car by herself on the way to church. None of us would have enjoyed it then. None of us would have been inspired, but you know what? She put it in the body where all of us could experience it, amen? And so that's the way your gift is supposed to operate. Your gift is supposed to operate so that every part of the body profits from your gift. Amen? So, so we do it for the work of the ministry, and then after the work of the ministry, we do edify the church. And the word edify means to build and strengthen. So here's the picture. You grow up, and after you grow up, you get in the right place and work. 
And when people are in the right place working with the right spirit, the church grows. Amen. All right, I'll prove that now. Let's look at verse number 13. Okay, 12 told us that we got the work of the ministry, edifying the body of Christ. Here's what 13 picks it up. Okay, so people have to mature, people have to work so that the church can grow. The church grows when we all, like 13 says, come to the unity of the faith. Now, I want to kind of elaborate here, which is why Bible study and preaching is so important to the body. Because our faith is what we believe about God and Jesus. And it is very, very necessary for us to walk in agreement that we all believe the same thing about Jesus. There are a lot of other religions that recognize Jesus as a person, but they don't recognize him as the son of God. And two cannot walk together except they be agreed. So we have to find a place of agreement first in the faith. We have to all agree what we believe, and not just what we believe, what the Bible has said about God. Okay, We all have to believe that God is the creator. And if some of us believe that God is the creator and some people don't believe God is the creator, then you're going to find a place of division. And any house divided against itself, it can't stand. And so we have to come to the unity in the faith, that is, and the knowledge of the Son of God. We have to all believe the same thing about Jesus. Okay, He's not just a great teacher. He's the Son of God. He's born of a virgin. Okay. If they don't believe he's born of a virgin, you're going to have some problems in agreement with them when it comes to the faith. And so we got to come to the common knowledge, unity of the faith, knowledge of the Son of God. Here that word is again, unto a perfect man. That means a mature, fully developed, fully functioning person. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You got to grow up until you get like Christ. And that's a lifelong task. Okay. Okay. When God gets ready to change us, he changes all three parts of us. Okay? First of all, he, he will give you the new birth and your spirit changes right away because now you've got the nature of God you want to do right. See, before you got the nature of God, you didn't want to do right. But when the nature of God came in, I'm not saying you got it all under control, but the, the want to do right is there. Okay? And then you go through the sanctifying walk. The sanctifying walk is for your soul man. And the better you see God through his word, you start pulling off stuff that's not like God. And as you walk with the Lord, you're sanctified. Last but not least, the redemption of the body comes in the resurrection. Because that's when God is going to change your body. So your change is a process. It's a three-step process. You know, uh, pregnancy has three trimesters. Okay, you got you got three sections, three three projects that God has to work to make you a totally new creature. Okay, spirit right away, sanctify the soul as you walk, and then when we are resurrected with the Lord Jesus, then He will. The Bible talks about the redemption of the body, the corruptible putting on incorruption, and the mortal putting on immortality. And then that's because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So. So we have this process going that's changing us, and we are not complete until we are uh, changed to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So uh, just about the time you get one part under control, God will reveal something else to you and say, okay, now work on that. And when you get that under control, he's going to bring something else out. All right, work on that. Okay, you should be working on the next thing. You shouldn't get stuck on a thing. And keep working there. Because you'll cycle into uh, bad behavior. Amen? Amen? So verse number 13 talks about the maturing of the person. The maturing of the saint of God. Verse number 14 talks about the community that we establish. And the stability of that community. See, the reason we have to mature is so that the community of the church becomes stable. Not chaotic full of confusion and distractions. Amen? Yeah. Okay. So we, we grow up to the fullness of Christ. 14 says that we henceforth, that is from now on, 
be no more children. And then the next couple of phrases talk about immature saints, people who don't mature, okay? So people who are children who haven't matured are tossed to and fro. That means they're wishy-washy. They're on this side one day, they're over here the next day. They're up one day, they're down the next day. Okay, God doesn't want that from you. He doesn't want you, can I say this out loud? He doesn't want a bipolar saying God. Okay, you shouldn't have real, you shouldn't have real, okay. you shouldn't have real, you shouldn't have real broad extremes for your temperament. Okay, the, the Christ is supposed to give you a calming, a leveling effect. So whether you are, Paul says, whether I am a base or bound, I've learned to be content. My temperament is not dependent on how much I have or how little I have. How many friends I have or how few friends I have. My temperament is, is, is really uh, stationed on what God has said about me and what the truth of his word says. So that we're hence more, henceforth, rather, no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Okay. Carried about means uh, like a kite. The kite is at the mercy of the wind. And all of its movements, all of its elevation or decline depends on the wind. Which means, and even though you got a string on it, you can't control where it goes because the wind. And that's the way children are. Amen. Whatever is in front of them has their attention. Okay. That's why we don't let them play with toys when it's time to eat. Amen. Or watch television. Or play on the tablet when it's time to do homework. Amen. 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 Because we don't want to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. In immaturity, people are tossed to and fro. Have you ever, don't look at nobody now, just look straight ahead. Have you ever seen these people in church? They don't know what they want to do. They try this for a while, then they get out of this, and then they try that for a while, then they get out of that, and they try this for a while. And I'm not saying that you ever, you don't ever graduate uh, to something else to do, but it's a sign of immaturity when you don't know exactly what to do and you can't find purpose and passion in something that you do. Yes, there are a lot of things I can do, but I know where my passion is. Amen, somebody. Amen. And people think I love music, but I love the word more than music. That's my passion. That's, that's, where, that's where I put my effort in. That's where I put my work in because that's the area that I want to perfect and that's the area that I want to bless the body. And each of us has a gift set and that gift set should be accompanied with your passion. And when it's accompanied with your passion, you work on it to make it good. And when you make it good and you perfect it, the body gets the good. Are you with yeah. me? Amen. Amen. We can't afford to get apathetic and at ease with a gift set because just about the time we get there, we stop working to perfect it. Man, good book, not a church book, not a gospel book, but a good corporate book is called Good to Great. And the concept of the book talks about companies that went out of business because they got satisfied being good and stopped working to be great. When they got satisfied being good, they didn't work to get better. And because they didn't work to get any better, companies in the same field came, caught them, passed them, and went out of sight. Man. So, and saints can be the same way. You can get so comfortable in your gift that you stop working to perfect it. And if you stop working to perfect it, you kind of get gobbled up in people who are hungry with their gift. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, so, um, not tossed to and fro, not carried about with every wind of doctrine, and by the slight of men, you got to be stable enough until people can't con you with the word. Amen. Slight talks about con men. And some people, some people, can I say this? Some people will give you a good prophetic utterance if they think they can get your attention. Sometimes God isn't in it at all, but sometimes the hunger just to hear something from God, you'll let somebody tell you something and you'll believe it as true and they'll kind you into a place because you're not stable and mature in the word. Amen? Amen. So, so by the slight of men, talk about cunning craftiness, that word cunning comes right from Satan himself. When the Bible said that the serpent was more subtle, that means cunning. Cunning are people who can do things slick 
You know, they're the kind of people who can pull something and not even look like they did anything. Amen. You know, them the folk who throw the rock and act, you know, put the hand in their pocket like they didn't throw it. Okay. So cunning craftiness, these people lie in wait to deceive. And people who are immature get deceived. And yeah. okay. when you don't know the word, people can work the word and they can work the word against you. Amen. Okay. So the community, st the stability of the church community comes from people who know the word. And when you know the word, people can't pull the wool over your eyes like something is true and it isn't true. Amen? Amen. Verse number 15 talks about the growth. And this is where verse number 13 comes of 1 Corinthians. It says, we don't want to be unstable but we want to speak the truth in the congregation in love. Okay, can I say this? Truth without love is damaging. Truth must always be spoken from a perspective of love. And the perspective is love is that I'm not trying to get you told, I'm trying to help get you better. Okay. Big, big difference. Okay, I, somebody posted, um, I can't, Trying to remember, um, former barber of mine, I won't mention his name, but he posted a, a, a post that said, I told you so, doesn't help him get better. You can say, I told you so, but that's not helping. Okay, what helps them, or, or you should have known better, that doesn't help. And even if they should have known better, what you have to do, you gotta come alongside like the Good Samaritan did. You gotta pour in wine and oil and you gotta try to nurse those people back to hell. That's why the Bible says, brethren, if somebody be overtaken in a fall, ye which are. That spiritual means mature. Okay. Immature people can't restore people who are out of fellowship. It takes somebody solid. It takes somebody seasoned mature that knows how to rightly use the word because the first thing you have to determine is where that person is spiritually because if you pat somebody on the back when they need a kick in the pants you will enable them in bad behavior and if you kick them in the pants when they need a pat on the back you will rupture the relationship that you're able to communicate with amen, amen somebody amen. so so we speak the truth in love and when the truth is spoken in love in the congregation, we all grow up into him in all things. The church grows when the body matures and communication is expressed through love and concern for the fellow man. Amen. We're not only just to love God first, seek the kingdom first, but we're to love our neighbor as listen, trust me, if you start treating people like you want to be treated, you'll watch the whole atmosphere change. Yeah. Amen. Attitudes will go down. Friction will reduce. The Bible says, surely the ringing of the nose will bring forth blood. And strife will bring contention. You know how you get rid of contention? You speak in love. And speaking in love, you convince the person that you're talking to that I'm not out to get you. I'm trying to help you. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen? So we speak the truth in love. We may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, here's where I want to settle today. So we talked about maturing in the faith. We talked about the work of the ministry. And I want to mention again uh, that I have tests uh, that you can have. I have tests. If you don't know your gift, there's a series of tests. I think the last time I said it was about 50 questions. It's 80 questions. <laughs> but, but, they're very easy questions. And I told you there are five responses. I really like it. I kind of like it. Uh, I'm neutral about it. I don't like it. I really don't like it. And so you basically have to put a number one through five on these. And then we can score it and tell you what your strengths are and have uh, you know, help to kind of lead you to the place where you can do the Bible the most good. Amen? Yeah. And then for you at, home, you at home too, if you don't have it, uh, you can email AbundantLove at Frontier.com and uh, we can get a copy of that in your possession. Amen? Yeah. We'll score it for you and everything and let you know. You know the thing about God is that he don't let us choose our, our gifts. Oh, sir. Yeah. 
<laughs> God certainly knew what he was doing because uh, if the Lord had a, let us choose our gift, uh, we'd have we'd have a, a house full of uh, spotlight people and not many background people. Amen. If I can use the term background, because I tell you all the time, there's no such thing as background. Okay. Every part of the body is necessary for the full functioning of the body. Amen? Amen. Okay. Here's verse number 16, and this is where I want to finish. When we grow up in him in love, from whom the whole church body is fitly joined together and compacted by which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. What that means, that means when people mature and understand their gifts and get in their proper place, when everybody's in their proper place operating their gift, that word compacted means it's an efficiency term. Some of us uh, may remember trash compactors. Amen. What a trash compactor does, it still takes trash, but it compacts it so that you can get more into it because all the dead and empty spaces, spaces are eliminated. And so a body, a body, I think Paul said it like this, he said, I run, not as one that's beating the air. He said, but I strive to keep my body under subjection. I strive to keep my body compact so that I can get maximum effort. So when every person matures in the word, understands their place, and operates in their place, the body starts to function like a well-trained, well-fit body. And as the body is working as a well-fit machine. You know what happens when you work a body and it's fit? It builds muscle. And when you build muscle, you get bigger. And so the church is designed to get us in place with our gift, operating our gift under the auspices of love, not to show each other up, not for competition, not to see who's the best, not to see who's the longest or the loudest. Or... See what I'm saying? So we're operating for the benefit of each other. The body becomes compact. It's joined together. It's working. And as it works, watch this. It edifies itself. It's working. It's operation. It's, it's carrying out its function. Allows it to grow in and of itself. Listen, if we get on one accord in an atmosphere of love, that's attractive to anybody that needs love. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. Okay, so... When we mature and when we understand our gifts and when we operate in love, we create a culture, a church culture that's conducive to growth. Amen. The word culture by definition talks about the customs and the norms, the art and the social institutions of a particular group of people. What it means are, are the things that are, that are normal, typical, and usual to that group of people. Amen. So there are some norms, there are some customs, there's a culture that the saints are supposed to have. The saints are supposed to have a culture that's dominated by love. And that's where chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians comes in. Chapter number 12 tells us about all those gifts and it's good to operate the gift. But Paul says it's good to desire spiritual gift. He said, but I'll show you a more excellent way. I'll show you the best way. The best way to design a culture is a cultural love that looks out for everybody, their growth and their development. Amen. And when you get in that kind of atmosphere, when you get in that kind of culture, that's the kind of culture that makes people that come into culture improve with the culture. Amen. Amen. If you're not good at something and they put you next to somebody that's good at something and you have time to interact with the person that's good at something, some of what they're doing is going to rub off on you so that you get more expertise in the area. Amen. A long gone trade that we used to do all the time that people now in the corporate industry are starting to take up again. Instead of just a training program, they're going back to apprentice programs. 
And what an apprentice program does is it takes a newbie and puts it right next to a seasoned person. And they get a chance to interact and learn from the person that's seasoned. So when the seasoned person retires and goes, they don't lose the skill because someone has been put in place to get it done. That's the way the church is supposed to operate. The church is supposed to operate in such a place that it encourages growth of all of its members. Amen? Amen. Amen. So it's the culture, it's the, it's the custom, it's the norm, it's the things that should be typical. Compliments should be typical among us. The expression of love should be typical among us. Forgiveness should be normal and typical among us. You know, if, if forgiveness is always normal, grudges can't exist. Amen. Amen, somebody. So it's the custom, it's the norms, uh, it's the social institutions, it's the way we talk to each other. Uh, the, the culture of the church body is family. It's oneness. In a family, we all have mutual love. We have a clan hierarchy, which means we respect our elders. We don't disrespect the elders. The level of respect when a person is elderly and older, I think Paul says to Timothy, he says, entreat the older women as mothers. Treat the younger women uh, as sisters with all purity. Don't rebuke an elder. You see what I'm saying? So, so that level of respect, that level of maturity permeates the whole congregation so that people are not disrespected and dissed in the congregation, especially when they start to age. Because when people start to age, they start to feel like they're not useful anymore. But the atmosphere and the culture of respect honors the wisdom and the years of service that that individual has put in. The Bible says, know them that labor among you. Yeah. Amen. And the Bible says, esteem them very highly for their work's sake. And so uh, to finish what I want to do, I want to read that 16th verse from the Amplified Version of the Bible, which I believe gives us uh, a very good understanding. From the Amplified, it says, from him, that is Christ, the whole body, which is the church in all of its various parts. So the whole church in him is joined, that means coming together, and knitted together. It's one thing to come together, but when you knit it, it's connected. We don't just come into this place but there has to be love connections among us so that we feel what each other feels. We weep with them that weep. We mourn with them that mourn. We rejoice with them that rejoice. You rejoice with people that you have some connection to. So the body comes together. It's joined. It's knitted together by what every joint supplies. And what that means is every person brings something to the body. And we appreciate what every member brings. Uh, here it's called a joint, but it means every mature operating member. So you're a joint. If you're mature in Christ, you know your gift and you're operating to make the body grow. Okay, you're a joint. The Bible has styled you as a joint. You know what a joint is? A joint is a connector that allows two parts of the body to come together. In other words, it's a, it's a mediator, so to speak. Your knee is the mediator between your lower leg and your upper leg. Okay. It connects them and it allows movement. Because of the knee, the bottom of the leg and the top of the leg can move with coordination. That's why you can walk. That's why you can run. If you didn't have knees, you couldn't run. Your walking would be strange. Amen. Amen. Without knees, you couldn't sit down. Oh, well, you could sit down, but you wouldn't be able to get up. Somebody have to help you. So, so these joints, these connectors, allow for the good movement of the body, the coordinated movement of the body. The body is coordinated by mature saints who know their gift and operate their gift. Amen, somebody. And when each part, that is each gift, is working properly, it causes the body of Christ to grow and mature and to build and enlarge itself in the spirit of unselfish love. 
So here's the way it is. Okay, you commit yourself to the word of the Lord. You grow and you mature. You find out your gift. You understand how your gift works. You start to operate because you want to perfect and make your gift better. And to whom much is given, much is required. If you're faithful over little, you're faithful with few. And what happens, you start at the bottom of the auxiliary, but because of faithfulness, when the opportunity arises, you're promoted. Then when you become promoted and become a leader, then you're able to help coordinate how the church moves. And when the church moves like a well-fit body in a well-oiled machine, the church grows because it edifies itself. Because then we're able to provoke one another to good works. Amen? Amen. All right, clap your hands right there. That's what Hebrews 10.24 says. Hebrews 10.24 says, let us consider one another. And then as we consider one another, we want to provoke. You know what the word provoke means? Provoke means, you know, to kind of nudge them and urge them until they do it. You know how grandchildren do? They'll come and they say, Papa, can we have that? I'll say, no. They say, please. Please. And after they say please enough times, <laughs> uh, Papa fold and cave uh, and give them what they want. Amen? Amen? And we're supposed to provoke one another to good works. We're supposed to say to people who say, no, I can't do that. You're supposed to say, you know what? You can do that. You can do it well. Give it your best shot. Give it your best opportunity. Amen? Amen. All right, clap your hands right there. That's what I'm going to finish. Amen. Any questions? No questions. Any questions tonight on anything I covered? Man. So we mature. We do the work of the ministry. And after the work of the ministry, we edify and build the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. God bless you. Let's pray and be dismissed here this evening. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you uh, for this talk word tonight. And we thank you that we realize we are a part of the body. We realize that we're not just a part, but we're a necessary part. And you have empowered us with gifts and with your anointing. You've instructed us how that we can be profitable to the body of Christ so that the body not only operates in the business, the Father's business, but that the body also grows and edifies itself in the spirit of love. So, Father, here is my prayer now for every listening ear. I pray that you would put a sincere hunger for righteousness in their hearts, that they would want to know what their gift, what their ability is, not just to know it, but to deploy it, to put it into operation in the church body so that it can be perfected and so that the body can grow and edify itself. I pray for each and every person here and those that are watching by stream under the sound of my voice. I pray that your will and your, uh, uh, your power would be shown in us so that we're able to do what you've assigned to us hand, our hands. We thank you for it and we give you praise in Jesus' name. The Lord's people said, thank God. Thank God. Amen. Amen. And amen.